In today's Gospel reading, our Lord invites all those who are weary and carrying heavy burdens to come to him, and he says that he will give them rest. Think about all those who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. What is he referring to? Recall that just yesterday I had mentioned um, or, or got people to think about what it would be like if you were an atheist. In other words, if you had the wrong view of the purpose of your existence and you're seeking for happiness in all the, in all the wrong things, eventually people become weary of it and they realize they cannot find the happiness that they are looking for. So a lot of these people who are rich and famous and have it all are often on drugs and many of them commit suicide because they're carrying this heavy burden of not knowing the reason of their existence and they're just miserable. So coming to our Lord, knowing what the truth is, enables us to live our lives the way that we are called to. It makes it so much easier. Imagine having hope. Now this um, invitation of our Lord indicates his compassion. He understands that many people are weary and carrying heavy burdens. And the reality is that I think every human being carries some burden, has some difficulty, has some trial or tribulation that they have to work through. In other words, nobody's living paradise here on earth. We're all carrying some burden of one sort or another. And if we carry it by ourselves, it's difficult. But if we have someone to help us carry it, it makes it easier. And God, our Lord, is offering his assistance to us. Notice how he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, what is a yoke? So a yoke is a wooden uh, instrument or a wooden piece uh, that's used to yoke together two oxen to pull the plow or two animals to pull a wagon or something and and yoking them together makes it so that they work together and the ideal is that the animals are evenly matched so that they're equally equal in strength so a yoke kind of restricts your freedom so by submitting to our Lord yes we restrict our freedom or we say, well, we're not going to sin anymore, but we're going to obey the commandments of God. We're going to live our lives the way that God calls us to. But this yoke is less of a burden and more of a something that frees us or makes our life easier. Why? Because our Lord, we are yoked with our Lord. We are united to him and he helps us carry our burdens. So think of someone who's, you know, suffering a lot, maybe in third world countries, somebody who's starving, maybe they even have some sort of disease, leprosy, or who knows what. Their lives are miserable. But if they have hope in God, if they believe in God, God will console them. The very fact that they have hope also makes their lives so much easier to bear. You know, even uh, what's interesting, not just even from a religious perspective, but even from the secular perspective or people who study psychology, they say that positive thinking is actually good for you. So when a person is hopeful, they automatically think more positively. There's something to look forward to, something to hope for. It gives them strength to endure the difficulties that they are enduring. But um, in addition to that, our Lord gives us comfort in the here and now. He strengthens us in the here and now to deal with the difficulties that we are facing. Think, for example, during the time of, uh, you know, uh, intense communism or even under the Nazis when people were taken away and put in concentration camps or taken up to, to Siberia and treated very badly and had very little to eat and out in the freezing cold and forced to work really hard. A lot of people lost hope. A lot of people lost faith in God. But there were individuals, such as St. Maximilian Kolbe, who persevered in the faith and shared their faith and consoled others. And if you remember the story of St. Maximilian Kolbe when they were placed in the starvation bunker, so somebody escaped and 10 men were to be selected to pay the penalty for this escape so that no one 
else would escape. It was to be a deterrent so that no one else would escape. So 10 men had to sacrifice their life. And Saint, when one of the men was called forward, he said, you know, I have a family, please don't, don't do this. And Maximilian Colby stepped forward and said, let me take his place. Surprisingly, the guards allowed him to take his place. So they were placed in the starvation bunker and St. Maximilian and Colby kept their spirits going. And in the very end, they all died. There were only a few of them left and Maximilian and Colby was still alive. They were surprised that he was still alive, even though he was in the starvation bunker for so long. In other words, God sustained him. God kept him alive and they injected a poison into his vein and that's how they killed him. So St. Maximilian Colby was a martyr for the faith he gave his life. So God strengthened him even though he was suffering so much. So God can do that for us. Today we celebrate the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I wanted to say something about that too. Mount Carmel is very significant for a number of reasons. In the first book of Kings in the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah, the prophet Elijah is the great, one of the greatest of the prophets. In fact, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. He didn't die. In other words, he was so, so great. And the prophet Elijah, when he lived here on earth, he was the only remaining prophet of God. And he was trying to oppose the false prophets of the false gods. And so he challenges them to a duel of sorts, a contest to see whose God is the true God. So there's the prophet Elijah all by himself who believes in the true God. And there are 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah or something like that. So in other words, it's 850 false prophets against the one and only prophet Elijah. And Elijah says, you know, bring two young bulls, you pick whichever one you want, uh, slaughter the bull, lay it on some wood and call on your gods. And if your god comes or your gods come and light the, the sacrifice, then your god is the true god. So Elijah lets them go first and they, they slaughter the bull, they lay it on the wood, and for half a day they're just praying and calling upon their God, and they're even slashing themselves, in other words, making sacrifices to their God, but nothing happens. So then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah takes his bull, slaughters his bull, and he digs a trench around where the wood is, and he says, pour water over this, this offering. And he did, three times he tells them to pour water over it. In other words, the wood is soaked, everything is soaked, it's full of water, but Elijah calls on the true God and fire comes down and consumes this sacrifice. And so the people recognize that the God of Elijah is the true God. And so Elijah has the, the false prophets, all of them killed, all of them are destroyed. He conquers them. And this all took place on Mount Carmel. So today is the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So the prophet Elijah was known for his great prayer life, his contemplation, his closeness to God. So he spent a lot of time on Mount Carmel praying. And in the 12th century, some hermits went up to Mount Carmel and sort of started this practice of praying the way that Elijah did. But one thing that was unique about them is that they had a great devotion to Our Lady. And they were noted for their tremendous devotion to Our Lady. And what's interesting is that it's like God wants us to make a connection between the Prophet Elijah and Our Lady. So the Prophet Elijah was taken up, body and soul. Mary was assumed into heaven, body and soul also. And the prophet Elijah conquers the false prophets and Mary is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. So in the book of Genesis, Genesis 3.15, it mentions that God will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between her seed and his seed, and she shall crush your head. So the seed of the woman is Jesus and the seed of Satan is all those who turn against God, those who are liars, those who are deceivers. But Mary crushes the head of the serpent and of all evil spirits. And as I mentioned before, the evil spirits fear God more than they fear Mary. 
Not because Mary is greater than God, she's not. They fear Mary because she's a lowly handmaid of the Lord and they cannot stand the humiliation of being beaten by Mary. How does Mary beat them? You know, the, the scriptures mentions the temptations of Christ. Mary was tempted too, but she conquered. She was faithful to God in the same way that Christ was. She more than anyone else participated in the crucifixion of our Lord, but it's her yes to God when the angel Gabriel comes at the Annunciation. It's her yes to God that begins this whole process and it's her yes to God at the Annunciation and throughout her entire life, even as she stood at the foot of the cross, it's her yes that opposes the no of Adam and Eve, the disobedience. In other words, Mary's yes, Mary's obedience conquers the no of all of mankind and also conquers the power of the evil spirits. So Mary by her yes crushes the head of the serpent. He cannot stand that. He cannot stand the humiliation of being beaten by a lowly human being, a lowly handmaid of the Lord. And so devotion to Our Lady continued to grow. And it's interesting, even actresses point out that the demons cannot stand Mary. They fear her. And they say that praying a rosary over someone who is possessed is just as effective, and in many cases even more effective, than the prayers of exorcism. And it was also to Our Lady, or it was our, our, also Our Lady of Mount Carmel, who gave the brown scapular to St. Simon Stock of the Carmelite Order. And the many people wear the, the scapular, the brown scapular around their neck. If you do wear it, you need to be enrolled in it. So wearing this scapular indicates that you are kind of like a third member of the Order of the Carmelites that you dedicate yourself to Mary, you place yourself under her protection so that you are protected from the evil spirits. And it's especially noted for its ability to preserve someone in the area of pure purity so that they will remain pure, less likely to be tempted. Doesn't mean you can't be tempted, doesn't mean you can't act against it, you can, but it's a kind of a reminder, kind of like a religious habit. So wearing the brown scapular is good. Having a devotion to Our Lady is not just good, and it's not just something that's good, but it's something that's necessary, especially during the end times. Many great saints and mystics, they said that devotion to Our Lady and to the Eucharist will actually be necessary during the end times because the influence of the world, the influence of the media, the influence of our peers, and the influence of the evil spirits will be so great near the end times that it's only those who have a strong devotion to Our Lady and to our Lord's true presence in the Eucharist and who are nourished by the Eucharist, only those will be the ones who will persevere in the faith. Let us look to Our Lady, to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, to intercede on our behalf and to drive from us all spirits of evil.